This is Rugby Union and this is Rugby League. They are two of the most entertaining contact sports in the world, both which have really strong Pacific Island connections. Not just for the overwhelming talent and unbelievable genetic build of players, but also the passionate supporters and volunteers spread right across the globe. You see, 20% of Rugby Union's playing community is of Pacific Islander descent, and in Australia and New Zealand, this number is closer to 50%, which is just insane when you think about it. Rugby League has seen astronomical growth in Pacific players, moving from just 0.1% in 1976 to match rugby's 20% global and 50% in Australia and New Zealand. I wanted to bring this to your attention. This is rugby's top countries for participation per capita, and if the NRL continues on its current trajectory, Rugby League will essentially overtake Union as the main sport throughout the Pacific. While it may sound like a stretch, it's a harsh reality. This is Jason Taumalolo, one of the goats of Rugby League who is pretty much responsible for the rapid rise of Pacific Island Rugby League in the modern era. In 2017, he made a game-changing decision to represent Tonga internationally. At the time, this caused a typical media hype storm, and now looking back in hindsight, this decision didn't just help Tongan Rugby League. It actually kick-started International Rugby League to a whole new level. For the rugby fans out there, this would be like Richie Maunga or Taniela Tupo deciding to represent Tonga instead of the All Blacks and Wallabies. While World Rugby absolutely dwarfs Rugby League to the point where you almost can't compare the two, this is changing. It isn't just Tamalolo's decision that is driving this shift to Rugby League. There's a domino effect happening. When you look at international rugby, Fiji, Tonga and Samoa are slowly falling further behind the pack. Then when you look at Rugby League, these countries are breaking down barriers which have historically made International League irrelevant. For the first time ever in 2022, a Pacific Island nation made the World Cup final in league. While in Union, there continues to be dismal results. Tonga lost by over 100 points to the All Blacks. Now you can definitely argue against the quality of International Rugby League, but that's missing the point I'm trying to make. When you see a famous person from your country competing for gold in the Olympics, you suddenly become more invested and more interested in the event. Which is why Rugby League is managing to achieve participation and interest at skyrocketing levels for Pacific Islanders. In Rugby Union, there's now 12 Super Rugby teams, all with smaller salary caps than the 17 NRL clubs. The problem this leads to is it's more likely for a player to find financial success choosing League as opposed to Union. And that's only at a first grade level. In Union, there isn't much money going around in second tier competitions in Australia. Hardly any in fact, but New Zealand does have a better structure where players are given reasonable salaries. But this is nothing when you compare it to Rugby League. To save going into too much detail, the tier 2 competitions in Australia pay players and have a lot more teams and therefore a lot more opportunities for players to be paid. And Rugby League isn't short on money either. With so many clubs across Australia making money through pokey machines of popular leagues clubs, this has allowed teams to provide financial incentives to players across tier 3 and even tier 4 competitions. Even more destructive than the pathway systems of Rugby League is the international incentives. This seriously needs to become a priority for World Rugby before it's too late. The Pacific Island talent pools are completely drained and often you'll find players representing their adopted countries. I don't really have a problem with this. What I do have a massive issue with, however, is there's zero incentive for players who want to represent a Pacific Island country. These countries have been crippled financially and not so long ago, players were having to pay to play at an international level. Yes, Siali Piutau and Steve Murphy both confirmed they had to pay for their flights just to play international rugby for Tonga in 2020 a team that was ranked in the top 15 internationally. How does the game let this happen? Contrast this to Rugby League, who did have a massive pay gap. If you were wearing a jersey for the Kangaroos, you were earning $20,000 a game and around $10,000 for the Kiwis. While the likes of Jason Tamalolo was earning only a cheeky $500 representing Tonga, the governing body for Rugby League intervened before letting it get out of hand and ensured there was equal pay for players regardless of who they represented. And while Rugby League is constantly under fire for their more than flexible eligibility laws, they are still seeing a massive boom in interest while being able to pay their players decently. I want to state that international rugby is incredible. It's actually in a great place at the moment. But I can't help but to imagine how much better it could be if there was more competitive top tier countries at the moment. I'm certain it's a push the game needs. Although this shift is kind of hindered with so many governing bodies already formed, it would be a battle for world rugby to have everyone agree. It's also pretty common for people to have the misconception that players would represent their country at birth only. I'm trying to make the point that rugby would be a better product if players played for the country they wanted to play for as opposed to which country had the better financial incentives. Then I think rugby would be in a great place. Imagine the added passion this would bring to every game. 
Rugby urgently needs to put more energy into supporting the Pacific Island communities, which have supported rugby for so long. Rugby League are literally sweeping the rug out from underneath rugby, intelligently targeting communities that are dense in Pacific Island populations, growing the domestic and international competition. As it stands, there's a massive group of players with Tongan, Samoan and Fijian heritage who mostly grew up in Auckland and Western Sydney. Rugby League is scheduling international head-to-head -head fixtures featuring high-profile players being played in these regions. It's brilliant, and they're winning a battle I'm not even sure rugby is aware of, which will present huge issues for rugby union moving forward if nothing changes. Financial issues and crowd ratings aside, the depth of players in rugby is going to hit a slow burn. As the Pacific rising continues in league, future generations of players will be idolising league instead of union. Parents will be more likely to push their kids to league clubs, and while this may not seem like a complete dead end, it's scary to think that with a massive shift in the player base, the quality of your local club's second 15 could quickly become the first 15 because there just isn't the same number of players coming through the system. Rugby Australia and New Zealand Rugby have tried to make some moves to engage the Pacific Island community like supporting Moana Pacifica to join Super Rugby. While this is a good starting point, it isn't really addressing the issue at hand. Moves must be made at an international level to support the finances, competitions and interests for Pacific Island nations. It just has to happen. It can't just be about the Wallabies and All Blacks anymore, because at the grassroots level, Australia and New Zealand need to keep the strong Pacific Island connections, and failing to do so will see ripple effects felt right across world rugby down the road. Let me know your thoughts. I'm sure there's some great points many of you are wanting to bring to my attention in the comments and I really want to read them. See you in the next one.